Hi. Hi, Kristen. It's so fun to be able to talk to you about the year one. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, celebrate its emergence into the world. Um, I know you're going to share a little bit uh, with us before we start talking, but I just want to reiterate what Melanie said to everybody who's here, which is that if you have not yet read this book, you should, because it's so good. And as I'm sure we'll talk about tonight, we're all coming out of 18 months where we've been thinking a lot about loneliness and you help us think about it with tenderness and rigor. So um, I can't wait to, to listen and, and see uh, what you have to share to start us off. Thanks. Thanks, Leslie. I'm so happy to be chatting with you. When I asked Leslie to do this, I was like, I can't, it's hard for me to think of nonfiction writers who write uh, lonely, about loneliness better than you. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here talking about this very uplifting subject. Um, I'm going to share my screen and yes. <laughs> <laughs> even though we've been on Zoom for 18 months, I still can't stop saying I'm going to share my screen before I share my screen. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit from a couple of different parts of the book. In amateur radio, operators call out across frequencies with a series of punctuated monotone beeps known as a CQ call. When pronounced in French, the official language for international telecommunications, CQ sounds like the first two syllables of sécurité, used to mean pay attention. Over time, English speakers took it to stand for CQ. A CQ call is a reaching outward, an attempt to make a connection across a wavelength with someone you've never met. It means essentially, is there anyone out there? And invites anyone listening to answer. In Morse code, it looks like this. If the caller is lucky, another user will hear and latch on, reporting their handle and location. These calls are broadcast across low frequencies, which bend with ease around the curvature of the earth, allowing for contact across thousands of miles. Callers may speak into a handheld receiver, but Morse code takes less power and cuts through noisier stations, pushing audible messages atop the static. It's customary to send written confirmation of this interaction using a QSL card, typically about the size of a postcard. This is an exchange merely of record, not an invitation to continue the conversation. The postcards function like participation trophies. They're evidence that contact between yourself and another person has taken place. Evidence in a way that you exist. Others have verified it. One night years ago, when I was in my early 20s, I was up late visiting my uncle. With a bottle of bourbon I brought him on the table between us, he began telling me about my father. He was obsessed with ham radio, my uncle said. I'd never heard of ham radio, but apparently my dad stayed up every night making CQ calls. He'd crawl onto the roof to fix the antenna he'd salvaged from a nearby dump, scavenging for another after a winter storm snapped the aluminum at its brittle center. His first receiver, a secondhand model from the 50s, built with metal vacuum tubes in a pre-transistor era, weighed 100 pounds. They grew up in a family of five boys in an economically decrepit part of rural Wisconsin. Their father drank, their parents divorced, and they spoke of their late mother with reverence to her sainthood the way that many men talk about their dead mothers. During my own childhood, my dad had the demeanor of of fathers I'd read about in historical novels I hoarded in my room, stoic, religious, extraordinarily strict. I was terrified to leave food on my plate or hear his footsteps slow on the carpeted hallway outside my bedroom door, fearing he might open it and see the mess inside. There was no bigger crime to him than waste or not respecting the things we had. My uncle's story was the first time I had access to my dad's need for anything other than order. I'd seen no evidence of desire beyond it. I'd never thought that he'd have looked for, of all things, connection. What does a CQ call sound like? My uncle poured another glass of bourbon and held his hand in the air, replicating the beeps exactly, his finger pulsing to accentuate each one. How can you remember that? I heard it constantly, every night, over and over. In order to operate ham radio, you needed to get a license, my uncle said, and pass a Morse code test. Then you were assigned a handle. What was my dad's handle? WD9JHQ. My 
My father started his own family a few towns over from where he was raised, a still rural, slowly developing subdivision, where I was filled with a basic sense of unbelonging that many children are prone to feeling. Beyond geographic remoteness and the impassable expanse between myself and what seemed like everyone else, I was raised with the tenants of Midwestern politeness. Be quiet, don't touch. When I was grown, I moved to New York where I was met with my childhood's opposite, the inescapability of other people. Living in a city can become a practice in containing the hostility for the strangers we feel alongside. Annoyance when a man's leg is pressed up against ours in a packed subway car, tempering our rage-filled glances at someone vocal frying to their friend or playing teeny music from a cell phone. The days are loud and long, and on some exhausted evenings, the simple existence of others feels an inconvenience. Strangers invade the monasteries of our minds. Congestions puts those we don't know and will likely never speak to on brief and shifting stages, like department store windows about to be redressed at the end of the season. A girl slumped on her side in the subway, asleep on her way home from on her way back from school. A man's face illuminated by his laptop's glow through a ground floor window as he sits alone in his apartment. A woman leaning into a post as she holds her cell phone tightly to her ear in an empty parking lot. I didn't expect the ease with which I'd come to project loneliness onto these moments. Apply an Edward Hopper glaze over the crystalline banality of a stranger's routine. When I walk down a street at night and catch the corner of a bedroom beyond a window's curtain, or see a woman fumbling for her keys on her apartment's front stoop, I'm surprised by the longing I feel for the people I pass and the homes I'll never be invited into, or perhaps more accurately, for the lives I'll never live. How quickly then my annoyance at the proximity of other people turns into tenderness. The grating of a subway car coming down the tracks, its sharp staccato screeching, becomes not the sound of aging infrastructure, but a chorus of solitary voices, like searching CQ calls. The more I've watched companionless strangers, the more I've come to think that these moments are only lonely for those who are observing them. Perhaps we see loneliness in others simply to feel less lonely ourselves. As cul-de-sacs were being paved and shiny nameplates staked outside new developments in the domestic lull after World War II, the television laugh track was born. Suburban sprawl made way for a boom in private entertainment. Radios and TVs at home held a hassle-free allure over downtown theaters. Creating defined spaces around oneself was so foundational to the 20th century American dream that separation was part of its formula. When a down-home comedian named Bob Burns appeared on Bing Crosby's radio show in the early 50s, the live studio audience went crazy over jokes the show writers deemed too inappropriate to air. They howled, slapping their hands against their thighs. The producers cut Bob's jokes but kept the recordings of the laughs he procured, and when a last funny guest later appeared on the show, they spliced in the week's old laughter and put it on the radio. Early sitcoms Early television comedies were often filmed before an audience too, though generally the performance was repeated several times. The actors running the same scenes again and again so they could be recorded from different angles. But a room full of real people couldn't be relied upon to react like they were supposed to. Sometimes they laughed before the punchline or they didn't laugh hard enough or they laughed in excess too long and too loudly. A sound engineer at CBS set to fix the problem by inserting additional laughter or fading it out when a joke didn't land as intended. The technique was named sweetening. He built a machine. Okay, so whenever there's text along the top, I think for now, and I'm just gonna let you read that because I can't see it from the Zoom thing. So read that quietly amongst yourself and then I'll move on. The device contained hundreds of distinct laughs, all designed to sound like real people or prototypes of real people. One was named Housewife Giggles, another was constructed to replicate the hollow response of someone who doesn't get the joke but laughs along anyway. The goal was to create the sounds of a room that the viewer wanted to be inside. A fabrication designed to make the unreal more real or at least recognizable. 
The laugh track of 90 sitcoms trained me towards a cultural consciousness I didn't know existed until I saw it performed on the old TV I'd found in the basement and hid in my bedroom closet. When I arranged its antennas at the carefulest angle, I could crack, crank its knob to a nearly single, or to a single nearly static free channel. I watched at a volume one notch above mute so my parents couldn't hear from their bedroom across the hall. Friends reruns aired at 9.30 every night, and though I didn't understand many of the jokes, the audience's laughter taught me what I was supposed to find funny. Just as I was learning the rules of Friends and came to understand its cadence, the show lost its time slot to Spin City, and a few months after that, Frasier took its place. Each time the show changed over, the loss felt insurmountable. I had resisted these new characters each time, was even disoriented by them but inevitably grew to love them all, only to discover one night without warning that they were gone. But each 22 minute offering brought with it an education too. This is what friendship is, I thought. This is what love looks like. This is what my life might become. The laugh track of each show was the lesson in what I was supposed to feel and know and a promise for something I could someday be. Actor David Niven called the laugh track the single greatest affront to public intelligence I know. It's true that producers, I'm guessing in this language here, it's implemented laugh tracks largely because producers didn't trust their, their audiences enough to know it was funny. A laugh track tells a viewer when they should laugh. But this limited explanation ignores basic tenets of human biology. People process sounds like laughter, crying and screaming through the region of the brain that prepares facial muscles to move in a way that align with the sounds they're hearing, encouraging them to unconsciously mimic someone else's joy or distress. The premotor cortex responds more rapidly to positive sounds like laughter than it does to noises associated with pain or discomfort. The brain releases endorphins when a person engages in social laughter, suggesting that it's used to build and reinforce long-term relationships. It makes us feel good and we want to feel good again. Evolutionary biologists posit that language preceded language. Primates and early humans used airy, laugh-like panting to signal the advent of play. Deep, uncontrolled laughter remains the most animal sound humans make. Neuroscientist Robert Provine spent the late 90s documenting laughter, using a tape recorder to capture the sounds of strangers in everyday settings. He found that humans were a full 30 times more likely to laugh when they were grouped than when they were by themselves. The laugh track functions by coaxing a solitary viewer into a sense that she isn't, in fact, alone. When I was the same age as my father was, when he spent his nights making CQ calls on ham radio, I courted my radio too. Each Sunday night, I lay in bed and listened to Casey Kasem's Top 40 Countdown, his smooth elder voice, a clockwork comfort. He signed off each program by saying, keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. It felt like the most beautiful, most true platitude I had ever heard. I didn't listen for the popular songs, although I often liked them and heard myself in all the angst sung about the kinds of love I was many years away from feeling, but thought I already understood. I listened for the reader submitted letters that Casey read throughout the show, long distance dedications in which a person wrote about someone far away and asked Casey to play them a song. Okay, read the, read the beginning part amongst yourself. Okay, I think I remember it. The narratives in these letters were sometimes ordinary, like when someone's husband was transferred across the country for work or deployed overseas and they were making it work apart for a while. The song and the letter was a testament to the reunion they would someday have and the unbroken bond they'd maintain until then. But more often, the letters were pleas for repair with an estranged parent or a former lover or a friend who'd wronged and wanted things right again. The subtext of all these letters, no matter what hope the writer reached out with, was that resolution wasn't coming. The song was simply a song to that loss, a performance of grief and regret to someone who would not or could not be listening. 
I felt comforted by their stories. I'd experienced so little and their letters were an outlet for the misplaced pain I didn't have an excuse for. A woman's best friend had died, so now she went to the movies alone each week, no longer saving the seat next to her. A father regretted leaving his son when he conceived him much too young. A sister wrote to say, I wish I could find my brother. An ineffectual way to express longing is through gestures that must have rarely yielded results, but maybe the act of telling was the catharsis many were writing toward. These were personal letters mailed to a stranger who read them to millions of people. And that seems to me very brave. The intensity of my loneliness at 33 is unmatched to what it was when I was lying in bed with the radio at nine or 12 or 15. Though now it is much deeper and I understand its cost. I know that some of us will do anything we can to keep ourselves from feeling alone or to remain tethered within the everyday. I know too how so many of us fail, build ourselves little worlds of isolation from which we're unable to break free. I want us to use loneliness, yours and mine, to find our way back to each other. I want us to play songs for each other on the radio. And when we call out across an airwave or a telephone or a chat room or an app or a city street or an open field or a bedroom, I want us each to hear miraculously a voice calling back. So lovely to hear you read and to be able to, um, to, uh, to listen and see at once. And I, in a way I feel like um, the, the technological possibilities of the screen share have have all been building towards this moment because it's <laughs> the screen share that um, that you feel like you're actually kind of entering like 1980s Tron style the world of somebody else's computer and I actually felt like I got to <laughs> enter somehow my digital avatar body into the world of this book which is um is a world full of loneliness, but there's such um, close human attention in it that it also feels um, like um, that phrase that comes up near the end, like um, a plea for a repair as well. It's so full of humanity. I'm just, I was so struck even in how you paired the beginning of the book and the end, the way that you said, you know, you talked about growing up in the Midwest with these imperatives of um, be quiet, don't touch. And I was thinking about how the sections of the book um, some are called listen and some are called touch and in a way the whole book is saying don't be quiet <laughs> and touch you know yeah. that it sort of pushes yeah. back against those um, but it's inc it is incredible so what I'm so glad that we just started in the in the um, thickness of the thing itself and one you know one question that was with me really strongly and maybe is a place to begin because I was feeling it so much as we were moving through those pages, um, I was thinking about the kind of particular challenges and possibilities of writing and drawing loneliness. And I was thinking about empty space and white space. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, it shows up all over the book. I'm thinking particularly about that panel that we saw um, where you're speculating that maybe we, we project or think about other people's loneliness as a way of feeling less lonely. And then there's, it's all that white and then the small black yeah. um, figure in the corner. And, but I guess I was curious how you thought about empty space and white space and making pages that were empty and making pages that were more crowded and, and those sorts of visual possibilities in terms of exploring loneliness. Yeah, I mean, that's, okay, so this book is very different from other pro other projects I've drawn before. It's very different from my first book in that it's not in, it's not sequential. It's not in traditional comics panels. And I can't remember how that started. Like, I can't remember if I thought this would be in panels and then decided not. Like, I, it just feels like this is just the form that it just came out in. And I, I don't think I necessarily always make even conscious choices about like composition or how full or simple I want a page to be. Like it just sort of feels like, the thing I really love about comics and graphic art is that it's never really about like represent, representing something as it is, it's about representing the feeling of the thing. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes when I'm drawing a page, I might, I just, it's just like, I'm just following a specific feeling and then it just sort of, 
but you know, like that, that, that figure, the silhouetted figure on that page, like you identified, like that was actually a, a figure that I drew with like an extremely detailed background um, before I really knew the project was going to be a book. And then I ended up just, just pulling that figure out and putting it on the page. So there's a fair amount of that too, which is also just, um, there's a lot of pitfalls to drawing digitally. Like it's hard to recreate that handmade feel, but that's an advantage of drawing digitally as you can just like move stuff, move stuff around. Well, and I love that idea of um, emptying out a frame too. It's almost like the graphic equivalent of erasure poetry or something where yeah. like, it was on a very populated page, but then you have the ability to take away the rest of what populates the page and just leave that that silhouette behind. And, you know, I was just so aware of, of um, the spaces around and between bodies or even the space between the microphone and the ham radio early on, you know, because of what your language is doing, those spaces between the graphic representations feel as kind of pulsing with feeling as the images themselves. And I love that way that you just put it, that you're sort of drawing not what things are, but how they feel. Um, and I guess in that vein, and I remember this came up some in the discussion um, when you um, launched Foresight, who I think is here, um, Foresight's beautiful book, Justine, a few months back um, in terms of uh, thinking about how writing and drawing evoke emotional realities. And I'm curious for you what, um, what kind of like what sorts of, what dimensions of experience are sort of easier to evoke with language and what dimensions of experience are, are easier to evoke with visuals? I mean, probably I imagine the process is less categorical and more intuitive and organic, but I'm just curious what you find each of them does. Yeah, really that's the a other. good question. Yeah, I mean, I, for me, I, I think like every artist has to kind of come up with their own set of rules. For me, I think I made a rule early on that if I could write something, I would write it and I would draw it if I like, if it was possible, no, excuse me, I would draw something if I could draw it. And I would, and that's the only reason that I would write it is if I couldn't communicate in a drawing, which is usually like, kind of like essayistic questioning or like, you know, working through a problem or something like that. I think that's more true for sequential stuff because the drawings in this book, you know, they like, I think they contribute to the argument and they help further the argument, but they're not the drive. Like the text is really the driver in this book in a way that in sequential panels, they're really you know, like I don't have a character like moving through like on on its journey to work, you know, there's like things like that, that, you know, I, there it's just, it's a, it's, I think a wider range and some of it is more abstract, but the thing that was really fun in this project was figuring out how I could communicate those moments of trying to figure something out in images. And a lot of that meant actually just like drawing text and kind of drawing the research process and including like historical documents and newspaper headlines and stuff like that. And I think that was one of the really pleasurable parts of making it. I mean, I think research is the best part of a project anyway, because you're not listening to your dumb self, you know? <laughs> yeah. Do you do, do you do a lot of research for your projects? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, probably the best description of research I've ever heard is like an <laughs> to listening to your own dumb self. And, and I mean, I do really experience research as a relief from self. Um, yeah. I mean, I do so much personal writing that I think sometimes people could be forgiven for being, <laughs> I never get to know the truth is I'm sick of myself all the time. Um, I mean, and, you know, just that, that, that idea of documenting the research process, I, you know, I, it strikes me in thinking about this as a book about loneliness, that there's, a, there's definitely a feeling of company and intimacy that comes from those ways that you graphically represent the research process. Like, I'm even thinking about the section that you shared with us about the laugh track where you're sort of showing all the different kinds of laughter yeah. and the words are coming off of the image of the machine. This is where the limits of my technology, I'm like the machine and <laughs> then there was the box and then there was a knob. Um, but the, <laughs> the gourd is like chortles and guffaws and, um, but it's like, I, I felt that kind of annotation makes me feel quite much, very much in your company as the sort of narrator. Yeah, that's a really lovely way to put it. Thanks for saying that. I mean, I think that that's really the bet. That's really the joy of nonfiction comics. And that's what it, and that's what there's, that's kind of what makes nonfiction comics have this sort of like documentary quality. Um, uh, that's just, I think that's just a really pleasurable part. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we feel like we're sort of in it and, and those pylons of headlines and documents that you do get that yeah. feeling 
sort of um, sit, sort of peering over your shoulder at the desk. Um, and I mean, I think, I mean, on the question of process, I sort of hesitate to say the word COVID or pandemic because I feel that you are entered into entering into a tunnel of months and months of being asked pandemic questions, but I'm going to go ahead and ask one. <laughs> sort of a two part question, which is, um, I guess broadly speaking, like how how and where did this project begin for you? Like when did you have that moment of of feeling kind of the like quickening in the gut of like this is this is it this is this is my project like this is what I want to work on. So that sort of origin story, and then what what it was like, how the kind of contours of the project evolved. I'm not sure exactly at what point it intersected with the pandemic, but how the pandemic sort of shaped or shifted or either made you see the book you had already written in a new light or sort of reframed it for you. I'm just curious how the kind of arrival of the pandemic, which has obviously thrust each of us into yeah. different experiences of collective loneliness, um, how that kind of um, reframed something you'd already been thinking about for a long time. Yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was one of these things where like, so I started writing about like I guess I started a version of this project in 2016 when I started drawing people alone in public settings. It was a series I did for the New Yorker's Page Turner, and that was like really fun and enjoyable. And I was like, that that's it. Or and then I, you know, I had some like uh, conversations with my agent Jenna, who's here. Hi Jen, and she and I was like, okay, I'll just make a book of just just drawings. Like I felt like I I was like I don't want to do any writing. I'm just, I like I just felt exhausted from the process of making my first book. And I just wanted to just like think through drawings. And then as I started doing that, I started thinking about like, what actually is loneliness? How, how do we experience it? Why do we experience it? And then it just sort of like took me down this. And then I think it started too, like I was watching a Sandra Bullock movie because I really secretly love Sandra Bullock movies and I realized that like in every single movie, she plays a really lonely person like every character, she's just really lonely. And then I, I was like, this is really interesting because the way she's presented it as lonely is like very different from the way that, you know, like Don Draper or any of these like masculine characters are presented. And so I, I just, just started like kind of seeing it everywhere and then um, slowly started, I guess it slowly started becoming a book. And then with, with the pandemic, like the book was really close to done when the pandemic hit um, and I had, again a lot of conversations with my agent about you know should I should we should we work the pandemic into the project but in the end it didn't feel like this was really about you know I think the the loneliness of the pandemic is very different from the pro like the ideological problems of chronic loneliness in America the pandemic is was undeniably a horrifically lonely time for a lot of people but it was a kind of imposed is isolation I think there was also like a sense of solidarity in that isolation in a way that we don't have, I think, when if someone's experiencing loneliness for like a decade, two decades, something like that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I really, yeah, I mean, which kind of connects back to that panel we were talking about earlier with the single silhouetted figure and that speculation that perhaps we project loneliness onto others or see it in others as a way of feeling what's lonely ourselves, the idea that a, a pandemic that essentially was in which the media was telling us all the time and there was I'm sure a lot of truth in it that everybody was always lonely. There's actually kind of relief maybe in that sense of like, okay, now everybody is somehow even yeah. different in it. Um, and I you know one of the things I really love about your book is that you are simultaneously attuned to to, to um, temporal and historical realities, like the um, kind of suburban flight in the post-war era, like the digital era, we can talk about all of these things, but you're also really pushing back against thinking about loneliness as something too wholly attached to, to those like mm. historical, you know, it's like you're, you're not, you, do, you, you don't want to think about pandemic loneliness or digital era loneliness, yeah. post-war loneliness, you're sort of interested in loneliness as something much more persistent and yeah dynamic. totally and I think that like okay so I mean speaking of technology I I feel like every every sort of new era you know every new invention like whether it's the train or the um radio or the telephone or something there's all this like if you look throughout historical documents and like the newspaper every every time they're like this is the end of everything like the New York Times wrote about when the telephone was invented something like 
that we will soon become nothing but transparent heaps of goo to each other or something like that. It was like the most amazing line in your yeah. ever. Seen. But, um, but, and it's, it, you know, which is of course hilarious. It actually, the telephone helps us keep in touch more than we ever had before um, with people who weren't in our immediate household. And, but I, and so I feel like, you know, there's t- obviously we've, you know, there's been so much written about how the, the internet isolates us and there's a ton of damaging elements to the internet. I mean, certainly we can look at our, you know, election systems and the way it's, it's caused us to rethink what, what's true. And that's a, it's a really dangerous problem. But I think that, you know, when we do things like, um, you know, like come after like selfie culture and like it, sort of like obs- obsessed, self-obsessed Gen Z's online, that to me just feels like it's the same as it's always been. Like, this is just this new platform. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and just right on that, I mean, I, I was really, um, I loved the the way that you think about um, social media and social media performance. Uh, I, I, something I found over and over again in the book was that like the sort of easy shots, like the, you know, irony of people taking selfies in Yayoi Kusama exhibits when Yayoi Kusama was kind of inspired by the documentation of a tendency towards right. racism or, you know, the, the ways in which people sort of present selves or lives on social media that are not necessarily yeah. whatever accurate, whatever accurate representation of life yeah. is. I don't know, spent like 20 years trying to figure that out. But um, I think that you, you, you so, it's like you kind of acknowledge that easy critique and then you go someplace much more interesting and much more complicated and ultimately to me much more generous and much more illuminating. Um, but I would love to just, you know, the, the way you do that for social media performance, um, you kind of land on this question that I found really powerful, is display a form of dilution or is the broadcast part of what makes it real? Um, and I'd love to just hear you talk a little bit about how how you sort of, how you were exploring the relationship between social media and loneliness in this book and kind of how your thinking evolved over the course of writing and and whether more kind of more broadly you found your thinking changing in the process of writing the book or your opinions about things changing and what that change looked like. That's a really interesting question. I mean, I think that they obviously the more you learn the more complicated everything gets or the more you think about it and i i think at the beginning i had i was more similar to a like so like if you, anyone who uses hashtag selfie is like totally screwed they're you know they're never going to be satisfied they're narcissists whatever which is you know a really stupid thing that's of course not true um but i think that you know like the one of my favorite quotes about loneliness is by um is um from Emily Dickinson, and it's um, loneliness is the horror to not be surveyed. Mm-hmm. And I think that that when I think about someone like maybe performing for social media, I think like all we really want is a witness to our our lives and ourselves. And there is, you know, when we're all we've we 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 live in a culture that has become more and more separate from one another. Like we we move away f- further from home. We um, spread out more. We don't live, you know, with our families in the same way that we used to. Like in America, you're it's one of the main countries that we're going to live um, in a in a house by yourself or in an apartment by yourself. And so that's, I think, so we we're looking for tools then to it's kind of like the laugh track. The laugh track made us feel like okay, I'm in a room with other people. I think social media can kind of have that feeling for people, which doesn't mean that's a sol- that's a solution or a substitution for meaningful face-to-face contact because it's absolutely not. But I think I have more empathy for that impulse than I than I used to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think, you know, whenever I, I don't know, whenever I hear kind of the desire for attention deployed as a, of a form of character assassination, whether it's, you know, directed at millennials or anyone else, like I just, a part of me is, is like, well, who, who, who among us, desires no attention in this life yeah like what yeah. what strange form of sociopath with <laughs> you know is, is that is that person um uh well, okay so i'm gonna uh, on that question of 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 the the self and the desire to be witnessed i have a bunch of questions i also want to say um there are a lot of people here there's already a question in the q a um that i'm eager to ask but i would encourage 
everybody else here who's wondering about things, go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A because I'll, I'll turn to those questions soon and kind of pepper them in amongst my own. And sometimes um, questions kind of pile up right at the end because everybody has something to ask. So I would encourage you to just start putting them in there right away. Um, oh, so one thing I wanted to ask about kind of the um, hunger for witnessing, there's a, there's a phrase in the book that you mentioned that I found so beautiful uh, skin hunger about the desire for touch um, and I was thinking about it when you were invoking that Emily Dickinson quote the sort of just the witness the kind of witness hunger that we might yeah. have as well the hunger for witnessing um, but I'm curious about the just experience for you of creating yourself as a character on the page um, employing personal experience and I guess you know a thousand questions to ask about this but you know, when you were saying earlier that you have a rule for yourself that you only write what you can't draw, I guess I'm wondering whether you have rules or approaches or ways you think about when you're gonna bring your own personal experience into the narrative, like what you want it to do, what role you want it to serve, whether there were versions of this book that had a lot more, that had none at all, how you kind of landed here in terms of the rules itself. Um, it was like a slow coming around. I if I had had my way initially, I wouldn't be in the book at all. Like I was just really so fascinated by the research and by the science that I just wanted to um, write about that and make a book about that was very outward facing. And then I had early reader friends um, who were just like, why are you doing this project? Like you, great research, but like, why are you doing it? You know? And so like over time, I think I came around to being in the book a little bit more, but I think like, I, I, I think like one's own relationship to loneliness is like a very complicated, confusing thing. And it's, it's difficult. To, it was difficult for me to figure out like, how was, how will I really put that on the page um, in a meaningful way? So that was definitely very tricky, but, um, but the skin hunger thing was like, that's a great example of, I didn't, I didn't know I would be writing about anything like that when I started the book. And then like, that's sort of the joy of research as you start to think about you know, you read one thing and it brings you to another thing and another thing. And then all of a sudden you're at this, you're at this totally different place. Yeah. I mean, and, 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 you know, thinking back to our earlier conversation about research as a sort of um, relief from the self or a, a tuning into a different radio channel than the, the channel of one's own voice or one's own limited frame of knowledge. I mean, that way that a book can surprise you by taking you to these, um, pieces of, of history or human experience or certain figures that you you know never could have even imagined is, is truly one of the pleasures of writing, I think. But I think we feel as readers engaging with your book, the pleasure of what, the, the pleasure of your finding and then the interest of what you found. Um, I saw in the chat, Michael, hi, Michael. Um, when we were in, kind of invoking this catalog of hungers, it added the hunger for rhesus monkeys to be okay, which is a real hunger, I think, for any reader of this book and brings me to actually another question. So part of, for those who haven't read the book, um, one of the figures who shows up in these books is Harry Harlow, who did research on isolation and rhesus monkeys. You can tell us more about it. It's, it's um, a harrowing read. Um, but I'm curious how you, you know, this book is full of fascinating and somewhat unexpected figures. So Yayoi Kusama's story is here. Harry Harlow's story is here. The story of the left track is here. Um, G radio signals are here. Um, I'm curious how you sort of arrived at your cast of characters, like how did you come to these figures? Who ambushed you? How did they ambush you? What, what can you tell us about kind of encountering some of those? Yeah, people? for sure. I mean, I think like Harry Harlow uh, was was very unexpected for me. I just became completely obsessed with him. Like I read every single thing I, that I could find. I, I mean, I read like every book that was published about him. I read all of the books he ever wrote and all of the scientific studies. Like he was just, you know, anyone who's taken a, you know a psychology class in high school probably heard about his um, very famous studies with rhesus monkeys. It began with, um, he was trying to understand whether or not the hypothesis that babies only loved, human babies only loved their mothers because they provided food, whether or not that was true. And so he separated these baby monkeys from their mothers at birth and um, placed them in a cage with two inanimate fake surrogate mothers. One was made of wire and one was made of cloth and only the wire mother dispensed milk. 
And they were like, okay, if this is true, like the monkey will love the wire mother and like ignore the cloth mother. And the opposite was true. Like they became like completely addicted to the cloth mother. Like they would stroke the edge of the fake mother's face. Like they became like super attached. And, and Har Harlow was like, okay, so I've proven, I've proven that like attachment is here. I've proven that, um, you know, like they're getting comfort in some way, but like, is that the same thing as love? And he, he started, like, he went down this path. I should say also in his personal life, he was a truly atrocious man. He treated his wives appallingly. He, um, he was like a pretty horrific guy in his, um, he was definitely a man of, of that age. And he became, he, he sort of like fell down this hole where he, like he almost became like this kind of stereotypical, like mad scientist. Like he, he want, he became, he started becoming pretty depressed and he started trying to replicate that depression in the, in the animals. So he like would isolate monkeys for up to two years at a time. So that they had never been uh, ever touched or um, by a human or by either a human or by another monkey. They were, they, um, and they, these, they, the scientists were like, these, these monkeys were completely obliterated. Then they tried to take those monkeys and like raise them and make them have children, which they didn't want to do. They forcibly impregnated them. And then the mothers were so um, incapable of, of interacting with the young because they'd never witnessed it, that they would like would bite their baby's heads off and like crush their skulls. It was just horrible stuff. And like, he still, every single time he wasn't satisfied and he went deeper and deeper and deeper. And then his like last invention was he created something called the pit of despair, where he would see how long it would take for a monkey to stop trying to escape. Um, and it was quite, quite quickly uh, was the answer. But I became, it, was, it became really interesting to me to write about someone who undeniably is doing really horrific, really horrific stuff. Um, and try to write that person with empathy or try to understand kind of the impulse behind that. And what's, what's wild about it is he was doing all these horrible things, but he completely changed the way that children are cared for. Like before his studies, it was, you weren't supposed to like cuddle your kids because it would make them soft. Like you weren't supposed to, you weren't supposed to um, have them spend too much time with the mother because then they were afraid they would get too attached. Like all of these things, these like horribly destructive patterns um started to change because of this research so he was just I was just like really um really fascinated by him yeah it was so earlier you were talking about I mean he's he is a deeply fascinating character and both his research and the way that you think through some of the connections between his research and his painful and kind of horrifying personal life is yeah. was really illuminating as well and and I was thinking about what you were saying earlier about how visuals allow for a different and I think often nimbler and subtler form of argumentation than language does but I was noticing actually just during the event that there's a graphic with a with a young boy version of your father on the radio that looks kind of like the pit of despair looks later on like there's yeah, a kind of rolling, um, yeah. tunnel and and I was just thinking it's so lovely that you can create those echoes with visuals in a way that doesn't feel as heavy-handed as language so often does. Um, <laughs> I have a thousand questions for you, but I'm going to turn to, uh, there's some wonderful questions popping up that I want to make sure we have time for it. And um, then I'll squeeze in some more of my million questions if we have time for them, or else I'll just hold you hostage somewhere, um, somewhere <laughs> in Brooklyn. Um, but um, DK wants to know, how do you think individuals can create with others shared identities that combat loneliness? I mean, that is the, is the billion dollar question. I mean, like you, if we can solve that, we can probably like save humanity. I mean, I, okay. So like, I think that there's a, there's a lot of flawed thinking around loneliness. One is just that like, if you're lonely, like go do something with other people and everything will be fine. Like that's not always a solution, particularly because if you are in a state of loneliness for too long, cortisol builds up in your brain and you enter a state that is called hypervigilance where you become completely like often very unwilling or un, or um, very suspicious of other people. And, and it, it makes it really, really hard for you to establish, um, meaningful relationships because you just are assuming the worst about everyone. Um, I, I think we probably all have a friend or relative that's, that's in that really horrible cycle. The second part is that just having companionship isn't the same thing as having a meaningful connection. And then the third part is that every single person has a, uh, different biological threshold for loneliness and like you're completely it's completely outside of your control 
So like some people have a really high tolerance for solitude and maybe never feel lonely and um, can go like, you know, you could go six months without seeing anyone and feel completely fine. And then someone else might feel panicked after a half an hour. So it's, I think the main thing is it's really important to just listen to yourself when you feel like you need contact. The second thing is that in that hypervigilance, like I was talking about, there's been studies that show that loneliness is actually contagious, that if you're feeling lonely, you're likely to transmit loneliness up to like three degrees separation from you because when you're lonely, you stop reaching out mm -hmm. and someone, someone else is feeling rejected. They're passing that on. They're passing that on. So I think you have to ignore those feelings of like, everyone else is hanging out without me and just, and just, you know, kind of reach out. But then the other, the other problem is that, you know, loneliness isn't necessarily just about your bonds. It's also about, um, the world and like the country that we live in. And I think America is sort of in by definition and by its formation, you know, a place that prioritizes individualism to the point of loneliness. So I think it's also just about like a major sh cultural shift in, in the way that we think about community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think so, so much of the time there's a kind of, um, there's a, it's, it's almost something I think of in visual terms, like you realize when you're thinking about individual solutions or the fallacy of individual solutions to structural problems, it's like this little window or door, but then you have to peel back and see the whole house or city or universe that that like little portal is embedded inside of. Um, and, your, and your book actually is always doing a kind of beautiful scale shifting between the individual and those larger structural systems. Um, and there's actually, um, there's a question, I'm going to skip around a little bit within these amazing questions that have been showing up. There's one that's quite keyed into the idea of scale. Um, Amy asks, uh, well, first she says, God, I just love the way your voice in the book transitions so seamlessly between self, other, and collective, between personal history and larger history. It's masterful. I agree. Do you think there's a connection between this formal narrative choice and a thesis you're suggesting about antidotes to loneliness? Or if that's a weird question, I'd love to hear you talk about what especially surprising antidotes to loneliness you discovered through writing this book. Okay, so let me reread that question. Do you think there's a connection between this formal narrative choice and a thesis you're suggesting about antidotes to loneliness? Um, I wanna say yes, because I would be probably smarter than I am. I mean, I think that I, I don't, I never really even know the shape of something when I'm writing it. Like, it's just like, it feels like a miracle by the time it comes together. And so I think sometimes I don't even understand the relationship between one thing or another. Like, for example, like the very disparate things I was exploring in this book, they were, a lot of them were interest areas before I started writing this project. And I didn't really, really realize they had anything to do with one another. But I think that as writers, obviously we are, we have obsessions and like obsession kind of fuels, I think our best projects. I think it's hard to be, it's hard to write something long that if you're not obsessed with it, because it's, it's already like writing ready is such as draining, arduous, sometimes boring uh, pursuit to feel like bored by the subject too. Um, I think I just probably wouldn't finish anything. So I don't know. I think I'd have to think about that um, for a long time. I mean, but I do think that it is about sort of an inward and outward looking mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. And were there, were there kind of surprising antidotes to loneliness that you came across or that you were particularly struck by? No, I mean, I think that though, like to me, the, one of the biggest disappointments to me of making this book was that I don't really have I don't have a solution to this problem. And I think it's not that I even thought that I would find one, but I think that I wish I, I wish I had like a slight, a, like, I wish I could like give, I think that's why loneliness is so confusing. It's like, you know, if you have a high blood pressure, there are specific steps you can take, you know, but if you have, if you're lonely, like it's like, it's so unique to a different an individual person and there's really no clear cut mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the things that's kind of wonderful about the way you write is you do justice to that multiplicity and that unresolvedness rather than trying to kind of um, solve it in some way. Um, uh, Mia um, is curious. I'd love to hear how Kristen experienced co-presence in her draw ends, both creatively and in terms of keeping loneliness at bay. I don't. This, this question is too sophisticated for me and I don't know that I totally understand it, but 
but I will try my very best. I mean, I think that, well, um, ones, by the way, I think that like, what to me, the most unexpected part of writing this book was that it did make me feel less lonely. Like to, I understood when I, once I understood, it's kind of like we were talking about Leslie, where like the loneliness of the pandemic, um, you feel less lonely when you feel like other people are experiencing it too. And I think understanding what loneliness does to your body, how prevalent it is. I mean, scientists say it's going to be a epidemic by 2030. Um, it makes me feel connected to, to other people. And I think it's also destigmatized it. We talk about loneliness a lot more now with the pandemic, but prior to that, I mean, no one wants to admit that they're lonely. It makes you feel like a loser or something like that, which is of course idiotic. Like you can have a wildly active social life and group of friends and a great family and still feel lonely. Absolutely, I know I'm now imagining like a, a wonderful series of sort of like loneliness confessions, just like <laughs> pouring <laughs> out the internet. Um, uh, Michael, hi again, Michael, um, has two questions. Uh, the first one, Imagine one thing only this, Kristen's first book, was done exclusively in black and white, whereas CQ is in color. Uh, what led you to this artistic choice? That's question number one. And then number two, can you talk a bit about your work at The Believer, um, including your work bringing comic artists into its pages? Um, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, I, imagine running on the SP and being in black and white was not an artistic choice. It's just like how it came out. Like, I think it was like the, the books of comics that I loved were black and white. And so I was like, so, so shall this be, you know, like I didn't, and I don't have a background in color and color is really its own language. I mean, it was really, that was one of the harder parts of this book was figuring out how the color, like if I have this color here and this color here, like, I think I understand how this color works and I think I understand how this color works, but then you put them together and they completely change the relationship to each other completely changes. So that was really hard, but it was also very pleasurable because you just got to, it was a lot of play involved. Um, and trying to like build palettes. And then in the end, I ended up doing like very limited palettes with like uh, four, usually four colors at a time. Oh, and then the Believer question. Um, I don't know. I love editing comics. It's such a, it's such a great joy um, to have a job that I get to, you know, just like play with drawings all day. It's the best. Well, and I'm curious, like, I, you know, I won't, I won't detract because we have a couple of other questions, but, you know, just thinking about what you were saying about research earlier is a kind of like um, relief from the self, I think. And um, it, it's so nice as a writer, I find it nice as a writer to have these other aspects of my professional life, namely teaching and getting to read other people's work and talk to them about their work like we're doing right now, all of these. And I would imagine, I, I'm not a professional editor, but I would imagine editing other people's work. It's, it just feels like oxygen to be, to have this like steady yeah. structural flow of other people's words and minds and imaginations kind of coursing through the, your system. Um, oh, I'm gonna to try to get at least one more question in, although I know we're almost at the hour. And um, Rachel, hi Rachel, um, wonders how does loneliness change people? What are the lasting effects physical, spiritual, psychological, or what have you? Um, loneliness is really bad. Loneliness will kill you. Loneliness, like there, there's been studies where they, there's something called the UCLA loneliness scale, which is how you, um, scientists determine whether or not you're lonely, you're certifiably lonely. You can be lonely and not think that you're lonely when you, if you score well on a certain score, uh, on this test in the same way that maybe you might like on a depression scale or something like that. Um, and people like, so they enrolled people in the study and found that, um, and like uh, on average people who were classified as lonely died seven years before mm -hmm. people who weren't. Um, and like uh, in other studies, like if people who were lonely were more likely to be dead by the time the studies were over than, than ones who identified as socially fulfilled. But like loneliness, um, if, you, if you live alone, there are all kinds of things like that, like that are, um, it just, it, you're gonna, you're more likely to get cancer. You're more likely to have a heart attack. You're, you know, college students who are lonely have a hard time fighting off common colds. Like it's like every single thing gets harder. Um, so, I mean, I think that loneliness, we also, we all go, situational loneliness is very real. Like we go through different periods of our lives. Like when we're in our, I think like statistically the, the times you're most likely to be lonely are in your mid twenties, your fifties and uh, your mid fifties and your eighties which is, makes total sense. It's like, those are, those are times when you're probably making a lot of transitions. Like you are, um, you know, you're entering the workforce, you're moving out of the workforce, and then you're at a place where 
you're losing your mobility and a lot of people that you love are gone. Um, so those things make sense. So I think we can move in and out of situational loneliness and recover, but I think the, the bigger question is what do you do when you exist in that state for, for longer? Mm-hmm. 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 Um, I think we are at the hour. There are a couple more um, wonderful questions here, but I think it's a testament to how much this book, um, how many questions it raises and how much it makes readers think and feel. Um, and I have to say, I'm just, um, is thrilling to talk to you about it today. It was thrilling to encounter it on the page. And I hope everybody who's here um, who hasn't read it already does. And it's a book that I know for sure I'm going to read again. Um, and just congratulations on its entry into the world. Spectacular. Thanks. It was so great to chat with you. Yes, that was fascinating and such beautiful work, Kristen. Um, We've got signed copies at the Center for Fiction. So come by, pick one up. Um, Congratulations. Thank you both. And good night, everybody. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks, Center for Fiction. Thanks, Kristen.